podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. In his most profound PBS documentary effort ever, Ken Burns captures the gripping realities of World War II through the lives of everyday heroes from hometown America. Tonight we bring you the war's African-American experience through little known but deeply significant and moving stories of North Carolina veterans. That's next on Black Issues Forum. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Hello everyone and welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm Mitchell Lewis. The battle for world freedom that took place between 1939 and 1945 has been called America's War. But while American troops fought the horrors of World War II, African American soldiers, sailors and Marines fought a second battle, one for equal treatment. Until 1948, all branches of the U.S. Armed Services were racially segregated. Tonight, we bring you a unique look at World War II through the personal stories of African-American World War II veterans from North Carolina. The first is about the first blacks to serve in the Navy during World War II in anything other than galley positions. Initially, African-American sailors were relegated to serving as kitchen help and servants to white sailors. According to the book, American Patriots by Gail Buckley, in 1942, President Roosevelt offered to establish an all-black marching band, partly in response to demands by national African-American leaders. All of the sailors came from North Carolina. Esther Vida has the story. The year was 1942, the war was underway. Men from around the country were called to duty, but America's united military front was divided by the color line. In all branches of service, blacks served in segregated units. And in the Navy, only white men were allowed to wear a uniform, that is, until the B-1 band came marching in. Music was our life every day. Music was our life every day. Ray Herring was one of 44 men recruited to form the B-1 marching band. Their task was to play for the students at the UNC Navy Pre-Flight School at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. At the band's 65th reunion, Herring reminisced at their original headquarters. Yeah, we're lying up here and then we march, march from here over to the campus, coming up, coming out here and going down. This way to Franklin. The men were specifically picked for this task from a large pool of talented musicians from across the state. I play piccolo, flute, and trumpet. I was a member of the school in Durham, NCC, and I heard about this called All Black Band Being Recruited. I played with the clarinet, so that I tried out. I'd never seen a black musician anybody was a Navy. The men lived in this building in the outskirts of campus. It's now called the Hargraves Recreation Center. Well, it was, it was just like one big happy family and uh, we slept down in the bottom of that uh, building there and uh, it, we, we just got along greatly, all of us. And when we go on the street, we could believe we could blow, blow anybody. And to us, that was, that was, that was our model. We always worked the hardest. Maybe, maybe you didn't get along with somebody else, but when you played, you played. They work hard to keep the beat for the Navy students all day long. Well, first of all, raise the flag. Colors, that's the first thing. Then we start, what the guys got to just got together, and we play for them. Drills, 
back and forth. But they did much more than that. Some volunteered at local schools that played at other events around the state. First, at this family, reunion, family, family friends and former neighbors remember the good. You're welcome. Thank you. And the bad. The band's first march in Chapel Hill was here on Franklin Street. It was a way to introduce members to the community. But the reception was far from friendly. Some threw mud, others racial slurs. But by all accounts, band members held their head up high. They got through that. Um, it was mostly a white crowd on Franklin Street at that time and, and uh, got to their barracks here at Hargraves. And a very different welcome. Uh, the community is uh, uh, beautiful and uh, just night and day, really. Besides their daily marches, band members often didn't leave the barracks. Most areas of the South were deeply segregated at the time, and blacks were not allowed to mingle or eat in most restaurants. But many say they found comfort in some corners thanks to community members. Sunday night, all the restaurants were closed. The cafeteria at UNC was closed. There was no place for the band members to eat. So. Charles Jones, the minister at the University Presbyterian Church, served suppers with President Frank Porter Graham. Then UNC President Frank Porter Graham, along with Navy officials and First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, collaborated on this pilot program aimed at elevating the ranks of black Navy members. Previously, they were only allowed to be cooks or cleaners. It's a huge step to see those dress whites, these very, very smart men, um, highly intelligent, the best musicians, the best black musicians in the state of North Carolina. You might argue that they were maybe the best musicians in the state of North Carolina. They were incredible and uh, uh, just really, really exceptional people. Following their tour of duty in Chapel Hill, the men were reassigned to Hawaii, where they continued to keep servicemen tapping toes. I am not a musician. <laughs> but I love music. This Chapel Hill resident was stationed in Hawaii at the same time the B-1 band took center stage. He didn't know the men were from his home state, that is, until a week before the reunion. But he clearly remembers the first time he heard them play. I hear this great martial music, and I get up to see where it's coming from, and here comes the band spitting polish right down the main street of the base there. It was great. They really knew how to play the music and they could march with a, they had a, something in their step just made you feel excited about it. After being discharged, these men scattered around the country, but they continued to strike a chord with others. I want people to know that he not only was an outstanding serviceman while he was here in Chapel Hill, but after leaving here, he went to Beaufort, North Carolina and became a teacher and was a mentor, a teacher, a friend, and many other things to a lot of young folks and served as a role model that allowed them to be successful in a lot of different ways. Walk on, walk on, with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone. You'll never as Ray Herring walks down the path he did so many times in the past, he says he can't deny the hard parts of being a B-1 band member in Chapel Hill, but he knows he helped pave the road for others. Because I was young and I was learning, so it was an experience, a learning experience for me. Our next story is about an African-American veteran who defied the status quo in the U.S. Navy during World War II. Robert Edward Sharp served from 1943 to 1955 and was not only among the first African-American hospital corpsmen to be trained in the U.S. Navy, he graduated at the top of his class. Robert Sharp served in the Pacific and is one of few black veterans who witnessed combat. His experience is one of a kind, and producer Deborah Holt visited him in his North Carolina home to bring us his story. You could say that World War II brought Robert and Jesse Sharp together. Jesse's aunt was the director of a military hospitality facility called the Hostess House, located on the Black Marine Training Camp Montford Point in North Carolina. And she let Jesse work there during the summer of 1944. A year earlier, Robert had moved from his home in Jamaica to Tarboro, North Carolina, to live with his father and finish high school. 
He graduated in 1943 and was drafted into the United States Navy. Robert and Jesse met in high school, and their paths crossed again at the hostess house. Robert says over the years, he never forgot her face, and today, the two are practically newlyweds. With the same clarity that he remembered the face of his beloved, Robert recalls his dark and glorious days of service in the Navy. At that particular time, every black person that went into the U.S. Navy went into what they referred to as the steward's branch. And the steward's branch was the branch of the service that served offices in the officer's dining room. And this was all blacks could do. That's all you were allowed to do. And I refused to serve once I was assigned my ship. I refused to serve officers. And immediately, I was court-martialed. I was put on bread and water for 30 days. Of course, this was something that was reserved for the officers of the Navy. But the enlisted personnel, regardless of their rate, took advantage of that opportunity to take advantage of blacks and order them around with some of the most ridiculous things. And it did matter, some of the ridiculous things that they ask you to do to shine their shoes, wash their skivvies, as they said. Now, the first time they asked you to do something that you felt was demeaning, what did you do? I told them to go to hell. I am not shining your shoes, and I will not wash your skivvies. You do it yourself. And how Over the course of the next two years, Robert was disciplined for resisting treatment as a second-class sailor. He was on punishment when this photo was taken. Now this is you painting. There's actually a smile on your face. Yes. I'm over the water here. I'm over the water. Oh, I see. This is all water behind me here. So I'm suspended on the side of the ship painting a boom. <laughs> but you were being punished. They can't break me. They can't break me. I keep smiling. Even in the midst of all these trials, Robert found time to excel as a boxer. I would play in the band, in the ship's band. I, I did everything. I played in the band, never played an instrument in my life, but these two fellows were professional musicians. He also served in combat. We found pockets of Japanese in the Pacific. Our ship and the destroyer fleet were sent in, wipe out the Japanese group. And that's what we're doing. Here I'm here with a Thompson submachine gun, and these are all we are going on a raid on the islands here. From the folds of a scrapbook, a drawing sparks his memory of a fascinating story. Our ship found an uncharted island in the Pacific. And they sent a crew to the island, and they killed all but one of the crew. The ones that came back told the commanding officer, the people on this island are black. So he then sent me with a box of jewelry, that shiny thing. Never did anything like this before in my life. The ship's cook did this sketch. One of the things we did, we went in after the atomic bomb was dropped on Japan in Hiroshima, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki. We went to bury the dead. And we dug huge graves and just dumped everybody in it. When you think about your entire overall experience uh, in the military, what was the particular hell that you went through? It was a heart-wrenching scene to see children, women, men, animals completely burned to a crisp. And we were sent there to give aid and comfort to the survivors. 
And I don't know if it's still there today, but we set up the International Cemetery at which we buried an awful lot of people. And I said at that time, I hope to God, never, ever see this again. What is your feeling about the military and about serving America in general today? That's a good question. My loyalty to America can never be challenged. This is my country. I will defend it with my life. But at the same time, I am not the president or part of his cabinet. But I think it is foolish to try to preserve somewhere else what is not evident at home. The first African Americans to serve in the U.S. Marines since the American Revolution trained at the swampy Camp Monfort Point in North Carolina. Until the enlistment of these Marines, the U.S. Marines had remained the only branch of the American military that excluded blacks altogether. On June 25, 1941, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 8802, which allowed for the enlistment of blacks in the U.S. Marine Corps. In August of 1942, a segregated training facility opened on an area of Camp Lejeune called Monfort Point. The story of the first black Marines is captured in a documentary called The Marines of Monfort Point, Fighting for Freedom. Right now, we'll meet one Monfort Pointer and his brother, both who fought in World War II, along with four of their other brothers. Deborah Holt sat down with them to bring us this story. To help America's war effort during World War II, Haywood and Gertrude Poole of the Oberlin community in West Raleigh, North Carolina, sent six of their seven boys to fight overseas. All six sons returned safely, but today only the two youngest live to tell of their experiences. Older brother Francis served in the U.S. Army's 184th Infantry Engineers. I was 18 years old at the time, and uh, they drafted me out of uh, Virginia. I was on the ship 14 days. I stayed sick 14 days, seasickness. And we was in a convoy. And when you get seasick, that's the worst thing in the world to have. There ain't no medicine, no drugs to okay help you. We went to uh, uh, France and went over to Germany, Luxembourg, oh, maybe five more, four or five more countries. I got into medics. I, were, I was in the medics. They put me in the medics in... Texas. I helped get the soldiers off the battlefield. You know, when they get killed, and I hauled some of them. Some get killed, got killed in the foxholes. And I was all over Germany and places like that. If a soldier had been hurt, he would go with the physicians. And if the soldier was dead, the medics had to pick the body up, put it in a bag, and tag him. So they had to uh, dig holes just like those men who were fighting dug holes because if, if they heard something say boom, they had to jump in the hole too, just like the soldiers would. So they actually ended up on the front lines um, while the action was taking place. They were trying to save lives and they were trying to pick up the deceased so they could bring their bodies back. He, uh, he seemed to have enjoyed his work, although somebody had to die almost for them to, you know, pick him up. They didn't put any live people in a bag, but if they were deceased, the doctor moved on. And, he, and they had to pick up the bodies. They brought their trucks to the front line, and in, in the uh, turning and, and twisting, sometimes one truck would get in, in the way of another. And that's how he said he got hurt, was between two trucks. 
uh, they had just picked up somebody's and they were trying to receive, go back where they came from and one truck came a little bit too close to the other truck. So therefore, um, his back was hurt. While Francis and his brothers Haywood Jr., Joseph, William, and Jonathan served as soldiers in the U.S. Army, his younger brother Hubert was the only one to enlist in the Marines. He'd been the co-captain of his football team in high school and felt fit for this branch of service that had only recently begun to accept black volunteers and recruits. He still has the journal he wrote in during his mission in the Southwest Pacific. Thanksgiving Daily Routine. Another LST met us going toward Guam, number 999. Everything as usual, shower. He keeps just a few other items of remembrance and reads the notes he wrote when he was just a teenager, called to manhood and service to his country as a U.S. Marine during World War II. We were at Guam on D-Day. D-Day, the day they go in, that's when the, the killing started. We were what we call a marine ammunition company. We handled the ammunition. When the ammunition came in from the United States, we took it off the boats, put it in our ammunition camp, and then when a group was getting ready to go on an invasion, we would take that same ammunition and put it on another ship so they could have the ammunition. So we were ammunition, 4th Marine Ammunition Company. Francis Poole was discharged from the Army in the summer of 1945. And on Christmas Day, Hubert Poole received his discharge. In addition to the many young men who served our country during World War II, young women served as well. One of those young women is a lifelong resident of Raleigh. Millie Dunn Vesey volunteered for the Women's Army Corps and was one of the first African-American women to serve overseas. Reporter Allison Miller has her story. At 89 years old, Millie Dunn Vesey has collected an impressive number of commendations. One has to do is share all of us. Her living room walls proudly host old army photos and newspaper clippings, but like many of her male counterparts, Vesey wasn't always so open about her time in the service. We never, no, nobody would know, you know, I never talked about it. One of six children of a widowed mother, Vesey joined the army in 1943 in part because she couldn't pay to go to college and also because she says it was the right thing to do. If uh, white women are going in, you know, to help, you know, then black women ought to also go to be a part to, to help as a part of this. We're all in this thing together. While many women served as nurses during the war, Dunn Vesey worked as a clerk. You had that records and everything. You had to get keep that records and, and send them off. And was one of more than 600 selected as the first Afro-American women's unit to go overseas. She says while the military was still segregated, she never personally experienced any hostilities. Black men had some very horrible stories to say. Some of the women who were on the campuses of um, black women, where they had black and white women on the campus, they have some maybe horrible stories. I don't have, the, I did, I haven't had that experience. Instead, what Dunn Vesey remembers is the awe of rural Europeans seeing black people for the first time. They thought we were the women in technicolor. Arriving first by boat to Scotland, Dunn Vesey eventually was sent to Birmingham, England, where she worked sorting mail. The job itself wasn't particularly dangerous, but she could hear German buzz bombing almost every day in the distance. You were awfully frightened, you were awfully frightened. However, not all of Dunn Vesey's overseas experience was so tense. This picture, for instance, was taken by the daughter of a British family whom she became close with while living in Birmingham. And I would go uh, on Sunday afternoon. But they would have tea. Um, I don't know. I, I, I never I had a meal with them, but they would have tea at four. You know, in England, they have tea at four. But that, that would, and that, that girl that was a, the, the mother and the father and the daughter. And I, after I came back to the States for years, I wrote to them. England was also the place Don Vesey learned of the Allied victory in Europe. It was marvelous. I was only. Uh, every day in London, 
And we went down, we were able to go down to the, when, when, when the, um, the changing of the guard, when the, 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 um, the paper came out, what have you, they, they came out in, uh, down at the palace that you would come down and just, it was just a celebration. Three days later, Dunvisi headed to France, where she spent another nine months as a supply staff sergeant before returning home. She says what she remembers most from her service was both the bond she developed with fellow soldiers. The friendship, the courage, the camaraderie that one has lasted you forever. And the sense of accomplishment in serving one's country. It gives one a sense of, of I guess helping mankind, not all for self, really. We're honored to have had the privilege to bring you these stories about North Carolina's African-American World War II experience. On behalf of the Black Issues Forum production team, we say thank you to all those American veterans who have served to protect our country and secure freedom throughout the world. For more information about tonight's program, visit us online at unctv.org slash BIF. You can also call us on the BIF line at 919-549-7167. For Black Issues Forum, I'm Mitchell Lewis. Thanks for watching. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.